Hello everyone, as promised, I'm uh, recording this video uh, as a way to give you some more uh, demonstrations of how to do the kinds of exercises um, that are in Chapter 6 on the Formal Logic Unit. So um, I'm going to go through this... Um, well, I'm, I'm going to use this video to kind of kill a bunch of birds with, with one stone, actually. Uh, we're going to follow the model of how I went through the lectures, in that we're going to do truth tables first, and then do translations last. But also, I wanted to show you um, one exercise that is like particularly tricky or weird in the instructions that might have thrown you off. I just want, I can clarify that. And then I can also point you to these documents that I have up on Canvas. They're in the files section. They're called, and I think they're in the module too. Um, here, let me check really quickly. Yes, they are here. Um, so here's the formal evaluations of arguments module, and down here you can see these extra translations, extra truth table problems. So I got a couple of these documents that have uh, even more exercises other than the homework um, from the our understanding arguments text. So you can get some more practice at this, which I have been encouraging and emphasizing that like learning logic it really is just a matter of doing logic um, and getting more and more familiar with it. As long as you know the basic instructions, your um, comfort level with it and your mastery of it just comes from, from doing it more, from doing more practice. So hopefully this video can, at, at the very least, um, show you the proper procedure for how to start attacking these and set you up to be able to do this stuff on your own and get more practice and get more comfort level uh, with it. Um, if you're ever hitting a roadblock of like banging your head against a brick wall, call me up and let's talk about it. Five minutes on the phone with me usually can get you unstuck and save you like an hour of frustration on your own. So don't, don't be shy about that. Okay. So let's start actually with um, this right here. So this is taken from the actual homework. Um, this is exercise 12. I asked you to do the even ones. But this exercise is a little strange. So um, on the exam, I will be asking you to do two types of truth table problems for me. Some of them will be truth tables for just individual expressions, like one string of symbols here. Other times, I'll be asking you to do this kind of thing. Um, let's make this bigger here. Um, I'll give you like an argument like you see here, um, <clears throat> and then I'll ask you to give me a truth table for the whole argument and tell me whether the argument is valid or invalid. Um, so that'll be your mission uh, on the second grouping of them. But this exercise, exercise 12 from the book, is not asking you to give a full truth table for these expressions the way I'll be asking on the exam. I, I like to describe this as like truth tables with training wheels, <laughs> so to speak, because um, they just tell you that A, B, and C are true and X, Y, and Z are false. So that's like calculating one line of the truth table, not all of the different possibilities, but just for evaluating the truth of the expression under one set of possibilities. So let's do a couple of these. Um, Let's just start with the first one here, not x or y. So I'll go over here to our whiteboard, and we can make this a little bit bigger. Come on, computer. Uh, there. Actually, let's make it really big. That's great. All right, not x or y. There we go. So it told you, it just gave you the values, right? It told you x, y, and z are false. So we're going to give it false value, false value, there you go. And now we start doing the inside out calculation, right? Um, so now that I know that x is false, I can evaluate the not x chunk. So uh, on the way that I was teaching you in that video how to do the scratch paper thing, I draw this little line with brackets to refer to how it's like covering, you know, you can kind of drag it up here. It's like it's covering this part of the expression, the not x part. And if x is false, then the negation is just going to flip that value. So not x will be true. And now we've got this or statement here, which is really just gluing together you know, this not x part 
with this y part. We know the y part's false, and now we know the not x part is true. So now I just need to remember how or works. Or is telling me um, at least one of these two things is true. And is that happening? Yeah, it is happening. The not x piece is true. So one of the two pieces that the or is holding together uh, is true. So that makes for a true statement. So that would be your answer to this problem. So number one would just be, um, let's see here. Ugh, there he is, uh, true. If you're doing a full truth table for this expression, it would look a little different. Let's just take a look at what that would look like. So if this was on the exam and I gave you this expression, I won't give you one this simple, but um, if I asked you, give me a truth table for this expression, you would make a chart with that claim, give a column for that claim. You have to ask yourself what letters are involved here. We've got X and Y. So I'm going to make a column for X and a column for Y. Just like that. And then I got to calculate all my possibilities. I, I like to put this like double bar here to remind myself what are just the starting conditions, the possible conditions, versus the claims I'm actually evaluating for. But with uh, two propositional letters, again, we've got the formula here is two um, to the nth power, where n stands for the number of different propositional letters we have. Um, so we have two to the second power, because there's two of them. Two times two, that's four. So I have four possibilities in the first column. I make half of them true, half of them false. So of those four, there we go. And then the second column, I'll cut that in half. So I'll, instead of going two by two, I will go one by one. And there I've got all my possibilities. I throw the not x or y bit over here for scratch paper. Um, <clears throat> And then I calculate these. Now, I already calculated what happens when x and y are both false. When they are both false, the answer we got was true. So we can put that in there. But now what happens under all the other ones? So how about this first one where they're both true? True. True. Well, the not x part is going to flip that to false. And now I can figure out what's holding the whole thing together. So with an or statement, I got two chunks. If at least one of them is true, the whole thing's true. And that's happening. At least one of them is true. So that's a true statement. Now, I promised in the last lecture uh, that I talked about logic that there are some tricks that you can do with these uh, truth tables calculations once you know them uh, really well. In fact, actually, let me pull up a, a document really quick. So here we go. Uh, also on the, the Canvas module, you have this uh, file called the Logic Truth Table Diagram. And that'll give you this. And this is that skeleton key I was referring to um, that shows you all the different uh, operators and basically how they function. Um, so under what conditions, what happens. Now with OR, the OR statement here, you can see it has three true values and one false value. It's only false when they're both false. And if at least one of them is true, the whole thing is true. So going back to the one we were just working on, any case in which y is true, so any here y was true, here y is true, I know the whole thing is automatically true. Because all it takes for an or statement to be true is at least one of them is true. So like when I didn't even have to calculate this part here on my scratch paper, once I saw why was true, I already know the whole thing is true. There's some tricks like that that you can exploit. Let me give you a quick rundown of the other ones before we finish this off. Uh, here we go. So with ands, uh, with conjunctions, um, the there are three false values and one true value. It's only true when both parts are true. And if at least one of them is false, the whole thing is false. So if I have like a big complex and statement, and I see on the one hand that part's false, I don't even have to calculate the other part. I already know the entire and statement is false. 
Now using tricks like this are things I only recommend after you're really familiar with the truth tables, like when you've crunched them out the long way um, time and time again and you're getting super bored and you've got this skeleton key memorized like the back of your hand and you don't need to consult it ever again, that kind of thing. Once you're in that place, that's when I recommend um, bringing in these tricks. I wouldn't use the tricks as a way to avoid <laughs> learning how to do it the long way. Uh, they will not uh, serve you that way very well. Um, they're sort of special scenarios. Uh, and that's really evidenced here with the conditional, because this one's a little tricky to sometimes work with. Um, if P, then Q. Um, you'll notice this, we talked about before, this is the only asymmetrical operator. P and Q is the same thing as Q or P. P, uh, P or, sorry, P and Q is the same thing as Q and P. P or Q is the same thing as Q or P, right? You flip them around, it doesn't matter. But with if P then Q, well, that's not the same thing as if Q then P. You can't flip that one. So we have to be careful about this. And it's going to make for uh, a strange set of tricks here. Um, let's make this, whoa, not that, not that big. There we go. Just a little bit bigger. Eh. Come in. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. All right, so let's look at what happens here. There's only one false case. The conditional is only false if the first part is true and the second part is false. That is the only scenario in which it is false. When the P part is true and the Q part is false, that's only false. So if one, either one of these two conditions is not happening, it's not going to be false. For example, if P is false instead of true, there's two options here. When P is false, two possibilities where that's happening, both of those scenarios result in a true value. So if I have a big complicated conditional and I already know that the first part, what we call the antecedent, is false, I don't even need to calculate the consequent. I already know the whole thing is true. If the first part's false, the whole thing is true. Similarly, with the consequent here, the second thing, the Q part, if the Q part is true, that's these two cases here, one and three, those two rows are when Q is true. In both of those cases, it's a true result, right? So if I know the Q part is true, I know the whole thing is true. I don't even need to calculate the P part. These kinds of tricks are mostly useful in cases where you get something like this. Um, the, I'll do it. I'll do it two different ways here. So we'll do uh, if P then something and then Q. So imagine a scenario in which You've got if P, then some big complicated blarg. Or you've got some big complicated blarg, then Q. Right? When you've got these sort of isolated, simple to spot what's happening on one side of the conditional, anytime uh, P in this situation is false, if I'm looking at my like conditions, I can just scan. Anytime the P part's false, I know the whole thing's true. Any time the Q part here is true, I know this whole conditional is going to be true. So that can, that's not going to eliminate all of the work you have to do. You can't do everything with the tricks, but it can cut down on a lot of work for you, which is nice. It's cool. But again, use those tricks um, once you're comfortable with the truth tables. Um, finally, there is no trick for biconditionals, and you don't need one for negations. Neg <laughs> negations are pretty straightforward already. They just flip the value. Um, with uh, biconditionals, the rule is if they have the same value, then they're true. See, if they're both true or they're both false, you get a true value. If they have different values, you know, one true, the other false, that's when it's false. So there's no way to evaluate biconditionals only looking at what's happening with P or only looking at what's happening with Q. You're going to have to compare them against each other, so there's no shortcut there. All right, so those are the tricks. Uh, let's go back and finish our truth table here, though. Um, so now we're looking at what happens when x is true and y is false. So y isn't true, so I still need to figure out what's going on, on the other side. I mean, with or statement, at least one of these two things needs to be true. 
and the y part's not pulling its weight, so let's see what's happening with the not x part. I'm going to have to calculate that. Negation's going to flip that x to false. Uh-oh. Okay, so here we go. Uh, looking at the whole thing, it's not true that at least one of the two parts is true. So there we that's our false value for the disjunction for or. Okay, so there we go. There's a truth table. We've got all the values calculated for um, and, uh, and have crunched it to see what happens with the expression that you're asked to evaluate. And this would be your answer, this part right here. We, that's your answer. That's how you do one type of problem that's on the exam, where I just give you a single line of symbols and ask you to tell me, uh, it ask me I ask you to give me a truth table for it. All right, let's do some more. Um, oh, uh, let's just say, so on exercise 12, hopefully this is clear now, at least how the instructions are set up from the book, you're just calculating under one possibility, but the exam's not going to ask you to do that. Uh, the exam will be only asking you to, um, I'm sorry, it'll be asking you to do more than that. You'll have to do a full truth table like I just demonstrated. Um, and I like this exercise for one other reason. Uh, you get some pretty complicated stuff here. Like this is pretty scary, right? Uh, this whole thing right here. That's pretty, that's pretty complicated. Uh, I'm having you do the even ones, so let's do an odd one just for fun. So you can see it's not really as scary as it might seem. Um, will this, well, can I copy this? Maybe. Let's just try it. Hey, look at that. That's really awesome. Okay, now it might be helpful to actually just, well, let's put in our initial values here, right? So they told us A, B, and C are true, X, Y, and Z are false. So there's a true, there's a B, so that's a true, there's a C, so that's a true, there's another B, so that's a true. There's a Z, that's a false, B is a true. Okay, so it might be helpful to just look at all the parentheses here and try to figure out just what are those chunks going inside to out. Um, so here we got Z or B with parentheses around it. So that's a chunk right there. And then this negation is modifying that. So that's also going to be another chunk right there. Uh, this B is being modified by that negation. So that's going to be a chunk. And then this or is holding together the not B chunk with the not Z or B chunk. So now that we've got this chunk with this chunk, we could figure out what this chunk is. And then that's all being negated. So we'll need to have another chunk that looks like that. Going over here, B is being modified by that negation. So we're going to have a little chunk like that. And then we've got the not B and C chunk with that parenthetical around it. So that'll be a chunk like that. And then we've got this or right here. And what's it gluing together? Well, it's gluing together this parenthetical chunk with this whole thing. So now that I've got that piece and this piece, I can do... Wow, these lines are a lot straighter than I was doing before. That's great. I can do this chunk. And then the final one is just this whole A thing all by itself or this whole blah. So that's going to be our final chunk to calculate is the entire expression like that. So that sort of visualization process of just seeing all the different chunks it's really not that complicated. If you're working inside out, you don't have to somehow hold this whole thing in your brain at the same time. That's not how logic works. We do complex things by breaking them down to a bunch of very simple operations. We just have to make sure we get them in the right order. So let's do that. So we've got uh, not B. Well, B is true, so the negation flips it to false. I can evaluate this and now, right? False and true. Well, for and statements, both parts have to be true. That's not happening, so that's going to be false. I uh, can't do more here because uh, i got to figure out the, what's happening over on this side. So going inside here, we've got a not B. B is true, so not B is going to be false. Working inside over here, 
we've got z or b or it's just requiring at least one of them is true and that's happening so that's a true statement oh but that negation is going to swoop in and modify it flip it to false now i've got an or statement here between a false and a false and that's not at least one of them true so that's a false statement and then that negation is going to come in to take this chunk which we calculated as false it'll flip its value to true now if even so far me just talking through this it might have been like whoa ho that's fast what is happening but so maybe you can go back watch the video again and like stop it and watch each step that I just calculated for and ask yourself okay did I follow what's going on there Did I follow what's going on there and it might feel really rough right now it might be a little slow and awkward but I promise you if you're if you're able to see like okay yeah that's how the pattern of or works that's how the pattern of and works and you just do it more it will get faster it'll start feeling more natural and at a certain point and it won't take that long I think <laughs> and let's say it'll take years or something like that I think it might just even take a couple days um, you'll get to this point where it's like as natural as breathing where you don't have to think about it at all if you do enough problems it'll it'll really get there and if it's not getting there let's talk about it um, this is the kind of thing I was mentioning before in the video where I'm like every student I've ever worked with we've been able to get to that place with it where they're like I know what I'm doing um, and and not in a way where it's like a guessing game where it's like I know exactly what I'm doing now so I want to get you there too I want you to have that experience okay um, one thing else that you can kind of maybe pick up on here of this theme of how we take a complex calculation and just break it down to simple points I kind of just keep going forward right now that I know that this whole chunk of the expression right here um, here let me highlight it you know this whole part right here this part here is all true I don't need to remember all of what's going on here it's already been accommodated it's already been calculated into this value now I just need to see what's going on you know with this whole chunk right here now that I know this part is false and I know this part is true I can figure out what to do with this or is at least one of those two things true yeah it is this part's true so that means that whole or statement is true and now that I've got a true or true I know the whole thing is true now you might have been saying to me Tim why did you just talk for the last five minutes because you just taught us a technique where we wouldn't have had to calculate all this stuff and that's right if you were using your tricks you'd see hey this is an or statement and one of the things that's on one half of the or is already true so it doesn't even matter what's happening here on this half and that's correct you know it's going to be automatically true but still it's worth it for the practice to do this sort of complicated stuff like this because not all cases will fit into the patterns of the tricks um, if this had been false then we really would have had to figure out all this now it still would have turned out true because at least one of them would have been true Let, let's just do that for the for funsies um, if this had been say X instead of a then this would have been false here okay, let's get, get rid of that this part would have been false and then we would have been like oh can't use the tricks we're gonna have to calculate it the long way and see what is going on with this other half of the disjunction of the or statement to figure out that it's true okay so uh, I hope that demonstration gave you a little bit more clarity and comfort um, let's go to the next thing that I wanted to demonstrate for you so here's taken from the extra homework problems uh, this is truth extra truth table table problems with full arguments and one thing you'll notice is they're using this dot symbol this is taken from a different logic textbook that I use when I teach 120 the dot just means and it's the same thing as and I think I mentioned that in my video lecture on on logic but uh, nothing different here nothing nothing that you need to uh, it's not some different logical symbol with different rules or something it's just and so let's do let's do a, a simpler one and then well actually let's just go for a complicated one um, what's one I like here that's one that gives us a bit more of the symbols to deal with okay I like this one 
Okay, so I'm going to put this over to the side. We'll copy it in here. So on the exam, you might get a problem that that I where I give you a full argument and it'll look like this. And I'll tell you, give me a truth table and check this for validity. So let's do a. Um, B or C, not C, oops, not C or B, and then A, B. This is, this is still fairly simple, actually. Things can get more complicated than this, for sure. So I, I'd give you the argument in full standard form, um, and let's get a little extra there we go so it's got the triple bar that'll let us get some biconditional practice here um, and now we've got to uh, set everything up for our truth table for a full argument I've got uh, three claims here um, and they there are three propositional letters showing up um, in this argument so let's go back to this so I'm gonna I'm gonna need to make a column for each one got a I'm going to make a column for B, and then a column for C. And then there's going to be a column for each of the claims. So there would be the, for the first premise, for the second premise, and then also for the conclusion. And again, I'll put this double bar here to make it clear what's happening. I actually think it's not a bad idea, too, to mark like which ones are which. So this is a premise this is a premise, and this is a conclusion. And that'll be useful when we do our final step of the analysis. Uh, I'll explain why why that's worth marking. So we got A, B, and C. And then we got here, I'm going to make my life a little easier and copy-paste this stuff. There's one of our expressions to evaluate. There's another one, and there's the last one. Okay, and then I lost part of my bar here, so let's get that back in there. Okay, cool. All right, and now we got to calculate all the possibilities. Again, we're going to use this two to the nth power, except now there are three different propositional letters that could each be true or false. So to figure out the total number of possibilities, it'll be two to the third power. 2 times 2 is 4, times 2 is 8. So we've got 8 total possibilities, and I'll make half of them true, half of them false. And then split that in half in the next column. 2 true, 2 false. 2 true, 2 false. And then the final column will go one by one. True, false, true, false, true, false, true, false. There we go. And let's give ourselves some scratch paper over here to work with. Um, <clears throat> uh, here's some fun things that we can use the tricks to. So I got if A then B. Going back to the conditional here, there's only one false value. All the others are going to be true. It's only false when the first part's true and the second part's false. So only when a is true and B is false, does this come out false? Where is that happening? A true is here, these four cases, and there's only two cases here where B is false at the same time. So those are our two false cases. And I already know all the other ones are going to be true. Isn't that nice? That was pretty easy. That's all we had to do. Now you could do it the long way too, um, or you could do it that way. Let's use another trick here. Here's an OR statement. We know with OR statements, it's only false and they're both false. We could work with that. But we also know if just at least one of them is true, the whole thing's going to be true no matter what. So B is all by itself here. It's pretty easy to scan over here and see when B is true. In all the cases where B is true, I know that the whole thing is going to be true no matter what's happening with the not C part. Okay, Because B is sort of locking down the whole thing. You know, one... One good apple makes the whole batch good. That's how this one works. Um, but for these other values, let's uh, 
let's crunch it. So over here in our scratch paper, we've got uh, four more values to calculate here. So what happens when uh, B is false and C is true? C is true, B is false, what goes on here? Well, negation is going to flip that guy to false. And then the whole thing is when you got false or false, well, oh, now at least one of them is true. So that means it's going to be false. So there's a false value. What happens when they're both false? Well, we could kind of just eyeball this too, right? If C is false, then negation will flip that to true. And then at least one of them will be true. So the whole thing will be true. There we go. Um, all right. And then we've got actually the same two cases happening here, right? Um, B false C true is showing up again here. So I know that's going to be a false value. And the, when they're both false, we calculated that as true. So it's going to be true again when they're both false. So we, we just fin finished that off. Um, here, let me, let me do it the long way. I was getting lazy. Sorry. So what happens when B and C are both false? Let's really, let's figure that out for certain. Let's just, it's always good to do it the long way too. Just to make sure we understand. Discipline is helpful with logic. So when they're both false, this negation will flip to a true. And now I'm looking at the or between a true chunk and a false chunk. At least one of them is true. That's all or is asking for. As long as at least one of them is true, it's true. So that's why we got the true value there. That's what I talked through a second ago. Okay, so we're done with the truth table there. Now we have one more claim to do a truth table for. When you're doing truth tables for arguments, each line of symbols is its own claim. We want to separate it out in its own column. Um, and what happens with one column doesn't really affect the others in terms of calculating them. Um, you're just always looking at the starting values, plugging them in, and chugging and see what happens. Okay, now this, this first one up here, this first premise, this one is a biconditional statement, which means there won't be any tricks for us to use. We're going to have to compare what happens on this side with what happens on this side. Um, there's going to be no way around that. So let's let's uh, plug and chug and see how it goes. Uh, first case, they're all true. All right, so I'm going to need to figure out what happens with this piece. And then I'll need to figure out what's happening with the whole thing. So here, are at least one of them true? Yep. So are these the same value? That's the question of the biconditional. Is this side the same as this side? Well, this side's true. This side's also true. Yay, that's a true statement for the biconditional. Awesome. OK, what happens if C turns out false? Well, even if C is false, so we got A true, B true, C false, A true, B true. Now C, we're saying, is flipping. Um, this becomes false value. There we go. This or statement, still true. And that means this is still going to be true. Because at least one of them is true. And then these are the same value, so that biconditional is true. There we go. What happens if B is the false one versus C the being the true one? Well, that's not going to really change anything, right? It's still at least one of them true. And that's matching up with what's going on with A. So we're good there. Now what about this final one? What happens when B and C are both false? Well, let's let's take a look at that one. Here we go. A is true. B and C are both false. We got that right there. Oh, not at least one of them is true. So that means that OR statement is false. And this chunk being false doesn't match with the other chunk being true. So that's one of the false cases for the biconditional. Again, here's the biconditional pattern. As long as they have the same value, it's true. Both true, it's true. Both false, it's true. It's only when one is true and the other one is false. Either way, that's going to get you a false result. 
All right. So there we go. Now, in the next four cases, we can see these are all cases where A is false. Um, let's actually just do this really quick. We're going to skip around a little bit. So here, we're calculating when A is false, B is false, C is false. That's this last possibility down here. All right, we're working on that one right now. Um, we already know when B and C are both false, then the B or C chunk is false. Hey, they've got the same value. That means it's actually true. The biconditional, if they're both if both chunks that are glued together by the biconditional have the same value, then the biconditional is true. Awesome. So we'll put true in there. All right. Now what about our other combinations? Well, we've got this one here where B and C are both true. True, true. And actually, for all these three cases, between B and C, at least one of them is true in all of those cases. So actually, with respect to all the remaining ones that we've got to deal with, um, no matter what's going on with B and C, because we already got the case where they're both false, and all the rest of them, at least one of them is true. So we know this part's true. And if this part's going to be true, but the A part is false, then we know the biconditional is false. They have different values. So that we can figure out for all those. All right, we're done with our truth table. So I, I, at the end there, I went a little fast and used some tricks. Um, but uh, I, I think you've probably seen enough demonstration from me of doing this the long way that, that this is probably good for this video. So I, I don't want to make this video super long to watch. Um, but I still want it to be useful. So if you want to see me do some more stuff, let me know. But um, I'm going to just move on from here. All right. Now, in doing a truth table for a full argument, I'm also asking you one final question. I want you to tell me, is the argument valid or not? I need to know that. And how do we test validity? Well, validity is a matter of, is it possible for all the premises to be true and the conclusion false or not? Is that possible or impossible? So can we get... All the premises true and the conclusion false at the same time. That is the question. And again, if the answer to that is yes versus no, we're going to have a different result. If the answer is yes, then that means the argument is invalid. If I was able to show that uh, this counter, I'm basically constructing a counterexample to the argument's validity. The validity, if the argument is valid, it's saying this this combo can't happen. The truth of the premises guarantees the truth of the conclusion. There's no possibility in which the premises could be true, and yet the conclusion is false at the same time. So if that can, if this combo can happen, if you do see that somewhere in the truth table, then you know the argument is invalid. But if the answer to that is no, then that means the argument is valid. So we need to ask ourselves which of the two cases is it? Do we ever have a row that matches this pattern right here? You know, the true, true, false thing. Now if there were more premises or less premises, it would just be whatever that is. Remember, you can have an argument with only one premise and a conclusion. You know, you just need two claims. You need an argument giving, or a claim giving support and an argument receiving support. That's all it's needed for an argument. In this argument, we happen to have two premises, so they both need to be true at the same time the conclusion is false. Do we have that? Um, here, I'm going to use a... I'm going to get out this. And let's see if we can find a counterexample. Uh, this one isn't one because it doesn't have the false conclusion. Same thing here. This one's got a false conclusion, but and one of the premises is true, but not all of them. Uh, same thing here, right? False premise, so that's going to ruin it. Here we go, false premise, and we don't have a false conclusion. Same thing here, that's not happening. Same thing here, that's not happening. And here we don't have a true conclusion. So none of the possibilities that we calculated for fits this pattern. So that means there was no counterexample, and the argument is valid. Yay! So 
your answer on the exam this red these red marks are not necessary to do um, that's I just did that for demonstration but your answer on the exam would would look like this hmm. You know, this would have been what I would have given you on the exam to work with. And then this whole thing here, or actually, sorry, uh, including this part right here. You'd say, argument's valid, and then you show all your work to show that that's the case. Right? No counterexamples. This whole thing here, that's your answer on the exam. So that's what it's supposed to look like. Um, exactly like I've done it here. Um, that's what that's what it should that's what should happen. Okay, let's. Uh, so that was some illustrations of that, and you can see like when I'm doing it the long way and talking it through, it takes a while to do one of these things. But once you start getting familiar with it, use some tricks, and it, it's just second nature about how these you know how these truth tables function. It'll start going a lot lot faster. I'm just taking it slow here uh, to help with explaining it. Okay, so I also gave you uh, this other document on Canvas, the extra translations, and this gives you some more examples. Whoa, I didn't want that. Um, some other uh, examples of claims to translate. Now, it's important to note these are not arguments. These are just individual claims to work with. Um, and when you're, yeah, so I wanted to say this. When you're translating, actually, let me pull up. Here's the homework. So when you're translating here, like an argument, like I really like this one. The Democrats will run either Jones or Borg. If Borg runs, they'll lose the South. If Jones runs, they'll lose the North. So the Democrats will lose either the North or the South. Um, let's go back here. Is it going to let me do this? No, maybe not. Here, let's try again. Boom. Copy. This worked. Before, I think. Oh, it's still copying to the clipboard. One second. Sorry, technical difficulties prevented me from doing that. So I'm just going to pull that off to the side here. I mean, the... The argument, as you see it here, is not put into standard form. You're going to have to use all your techniques, you know, leading up to the first exam to figure out what's the conclusion, what are the premises. And we have a nice conclusion marker here, so so that'll give us that gives us a major clue. Um, but they put it into an argument uh, in standard form here, and it will look like this. Um, we can number it up. Oh, wait, I don't want it in red. Here we go. Um, whoa, forgot caps lock on. Uh, the Democrats will run either Jones or Borg. Two. If Borg runs, I'm a Star Trek fan, so this one always tickles me. I don't think they mean Borg, but I like to imagine it. Maybe we should run the Borg in the New York district or something. <laughs> if Jones runs, they will lose the North. So therefore, the Democrats will lose either the North or the South. All right, there we go. And we'd have this little thing, and we could even throw in our little Triforce symbol. Now, on the exam, I will give you problems like, I'll have one problem like this, where it doesn't put it in standard form. I'll have other uh, two other problems where I'll give you the argument in standard form, and then you'll have to uh, put it, you'll have to translate it into logic. I will also give you a universe of discourse. Um, in the homework here, they give you letters but they don't tell you what the letters stand for. Uh, I will be doing that. So, um, universe of discourse. Here we go. Um, so we have, let's have J stand for, whoa, J 
stands for the Democrats run Jones. We'll have B stand for the Democrats run Borg. These are all the simple propositions that make up the more complex claims of the argument. Um, let's have N stand for the Democrats lose the North. That's one thing that it's talking about. And let's have S stand for woo, the Democrats lose the South. Okay. So that's our, there's our universe of discourse. Okay. Now, um, oh, the universe of discourse here. Let's make it tinier. And put it over here because you've got the webcam down here. Okay. So universe of discourse. What's your answer going to look like? That's the first question. And your answer needs to have the exact same shape as the original uh, argument. If you have one big string of symbols um, in formal logic and you're translating an argument, you automatically know that your answer is wrong. I see this every quarter and I still I try to warn students about it. So just maybe in your case, don't be that student, right? Don't make that easy, easy to correct mistake. If you're translating a single claim, it will be just a string of symbols. One string of symbols in logic is one claim. We don't have a therefore symbol in our system of symbolic logic. You might have noticed that. We don't do that. Um, any string of symbols is really just one single claim. So if you're translating for an argument, an argument is more than one claim, right? It's multiple claims. A claim supported by at least one other claim. We've got four total claims here. So whatever your answer is going to look like in logic, it's going to have to look like one, two, three, Four. However many claims are in the original argument, that's what the formal logic part's going to have to look like, too. Okay, so it'll look like this. There we go. And then each one of these lines is going to be basically the string of symbols that covers this expression. Now, I'm not going to do this problem for you, because I want you to do it on the homework and get that practice. But let's do a different one. Let's do one from my... Um, not that one from here from this one I, I like I like this one down here this one's pretty complicated so let's copy that let's see if this will work for me this time boom Uh oh okay that got stretched but we can fix that <laughs> I don't know why I chose to do that. That's a little weird. Um, but I'm actually going to distort it a little bit because I want to make it as big as possible that we can kind of draw on this a little bit. Okay. So eh, that looks a little distorted. There. That's better. Okay. So let's play with this. This is one big claim. It might look like there's a lot going on here that you're like, this should be an argument, but it's not. If you look at, there's no argument markers in here, and there's really not multiple claims that are in some kind of support relation. It's just one big, really complex claim. <laughs> and the first question will be, you know, um, okay, so when doing translations, um, you're supposed to try to capture the logic of the argument. Well, um, in a lot of more simple claims, in a lot of the ordinary claims we make every day, we're not usually making claims that are this complicated. Um, you're able to just kind of like piece it together. But just like doing truth tables, like calculating values for truth tables, you have this maxim of going inside out. With translations, the maxim is basically whole uh, parts to, or whole to parts, to basically divide and conquer. Instead of going parts to the whole, you go whole to the parts. So if I'm looking at something this complicated, my strategy is going to be to figure out what's sort of holding the whole sentence together. What's gluing the whole thing together? And there's some candidates here, but many of them are not correct. 
So Dixie Chicks opening the show, that's a simple proposition. Uh, in fact, let's, uh, let's just highlight those simple propositions. So Dixie Chicks opening the show, that's one simple proposition. Uh, Chili Peppers close it, that's another one. Um, the Black Eyed Peas show up. Um, and then there's a couple here. Gnarls Barkley performs, Rascal Flats performs. So actually, maybe I was getting a little ahead of myself. Let's let's make our universe of discourse, um, and just get that out of the way. Oh, let's not do that anymore, Brad. Universe of discourse. We're just going to identify what all these simple propositions are. Yeah, I'll make this a little smaller. So we've got uh, let's call it, let's say D for Dixie Chicks. Open the show. That's a simple proposition. Let's have C for uh, Chili Peppers. Close the show. There we go. B will be Black Eyed Peas show up. Uh, let's do G for Gnarls Barkley. This text is a little dated. You can maybe tell from the musical references. Gnarls Barkley performs, and then we've got, maybe let's do R for Rascal Flats performs. Okay, so we've, we've captured all of the sort of simple propositions that make up this complex proposition, this complex claim. Um, okay, so what I was saying before I, I, when I was getting ahead of myself, is that I need to look for the little pieces that are like gluing together the sentence. So implies that. That's one of them, okay? Oh, let's not use this shape. Let's use this shape. There we go. This is going to be better. So implies that is one of those sorts of phrases. Um, given that, that's gluing some stuff together. Uh, implies that is gluing some stuff together. And then this whole, like, neither nor business, right? You can kind of pick these things out. These are going to be representing logical operators. Now we've got to figure out which ones they are based on our the logical operators we have from our symbol language. But we also want to kind of be listening for which one of these is the one that is sort of covering the whole thing. And it's not this one. This implies that just puts together this piece with this piece. Um, the neither nor here just puts the Rascal Flats and Gnarls Barkley stuff together. Uh, this implies that only connects the black eyed peas showing up with all of that stuff. So the one that's really holding the whole thing together is this one. This given that. And the way you should sort of think about this divide and conquer business is you want to figure out what is that um, sort of main thing that's gluing it together. What logical symbol is that covering? And given that uh, is a, you can maybe hear it, is a hypothetical scenario. So that means it's doing the work of a conditional. But it's a conditional that has like, uh, let's make these really big now, like one big blah on one side and then a whole nother blah on the other. And we don't yet know what to do with that. I'm giving myself a lot of space here. Uh, all I know so far is that this sentence is like if this then that and it's some well, this big chunk and this big chunk right that's it in fact let me highlight that you know this given that puts together let's use a different color let's use this color this whole thing meow, with this whole thing meow. okay it's just like a given that B. Okay, let's go back now. So that's how to think about it. Simplify it. You don't have to think about all the different pieces just yet. Okay? Um, not all the component parts. Why is it still give me eh, black? There we go. Okay. Um, it's just a uh, like P given that. Q. It's that kind of sentence. Now, if we know it's a hypothetical, 
conditional. You remember from my last lecture, I was like, okay, there's uh, a technique we can use. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to express conditionals, and it's really important that we get the right thing on the right side, because uh, these are asymmetrical. And if you're not sure exactly what to do, we didn't talk about the given that pattern before, but I gave you this technique. If you can find a way to get this English sentence into another equivalent English sentence that talks about necessary and sufficient conditions, then you can use the sun principle to figure it out. So P given that Q, what is that telling me? Um, what, how could I find a sentence that sounds the same as that, uh, that uses talk of, uses the words necessary and sufficient conditions? So I've got a few options here. I could say P is sufficient for Q, P is necessary for Q, Q is sufficient for P, Q is necessary for P. And I, I hope um, you know, one of those sort of grabs my intuition as being like, yeah, that's got the same, that sounds like the same meaning as P given that Q. So it's sort of, given that Q, it's sort of saying Q is a sufficient condition for P. Q is sufficient for P. Okay. These mean the same thing. And if Q is a sufficient condition, then that means using the sun principle, right, sun which is like just like that, oh, yep. you know, with the conditional here. If Q is the sufficient condition, it's got to go here. So basically, this whole first, the, the whole second part, the Q part of this sentence, is going to go in the first part. Okay. Um, so this whole first part of the sentence is going to go in the second part here. So let's let's just let's just tackle that. So we're going to focus here for a second. And this is really how you can think about it. Um, let me see if I can do this temporarily. Whoa! Oops! I grabbed the wrong thing there. Okay. You basically want to just forget about all of this. Don't don't forget. Uh, or so there we go. Just focus, I know that this first part of the sentence, the P part, is going to go in the necessary, or the, uh, I'm sorry, um, it's going to go in the second spot here. Yeah, 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 that's what we said. If Q is sufficient for P, Q goes in the sufficient condition spot, so then P is going to go in the necessary condition spot. So this whole first part of the sentence, Dixie Chicks opening the show, implies the Chili Peppers close it. That's going to go here. And I just ignore the rest. That's the divide and conquer strategy here for complex translations. Just focus on it one piece at a time, just this part. And here I've got two simple propositions being glued together uh, by this, this little implies that thing. So now I need to figure out what go, what's happening there. Um, sorry, I have to erase that so we don't lose this entirely. Um, so implies that is another conditional and maybe you could hear that the implies that if it's got this kind of if this then that kind of structure to it and again I can play this game so P implies that Q um, what is that gonna mean um, P being true implies that Q is true well that's like saying P is sufficient for Q P is all you got to know to know that Q is present. So here, this one's this is basically just like saying if this, then that, right? The P part goes into the sufficient condition spot. So Dixie Chicks opening the show, which we figured out is just D, that's going to go there. And Chili Peppers close it, that's just going to go there. There we go. We got half of this done. And you can really think about it as like, that's eliminated. We figured out what to do with the given that part too. Uh, it's all the rest of this part is just going to plop into this whole first part of this conditional. Okay, so let's divide and conquer that stuff. Okay, what's holding this whole piece together? Now this one's more complicated. Um, in fact, let's give ourselves even more room here. And whoa, what happened? There we go. Okay. All right. So, which thing is, is it the implies that that's gluing the whole thing together for this piece or the neither nor part? 
Well, it's not going to be the neither nor part, because the neither nor part just puts the gnarls, barkley, rascal, flats. It leaves out the black eyed peas. But this implies that glues all that together. So now, um, you know, our what the book called the main operator, I haven't been using that language, but the thing that glues this whole piece together is this. Um, this implies that. This one is the one that's going to end up going and handling this whole thing right here. Okay? And we already figured out how to deal with the implies that pattern, right? It's going to be another conditional. Got another conditional here. And we know which piece is supposed to go where. So this black eyed peas showing up business, um, that's going to go on this side, get following this pattern, and all the rest of it's going to go over on this side. Black eyed peas showing up, that's a simple proposition. We can handle this no problem by just putting a b here there we go sweet so now we just need to figure out what to do with the rest of it you see how we're slowly taking this apart just one piece at a time right and with the rest of this we're going to have another kind of big mess of stuff to handle this this whole chunk okay so we got this covered because that's this implies that so now what's gluing together this final chunk? Um, let's actually get rid of this part so it's not distracting. This neither nor is the operator that's holding this chunk together right here. Okay. So what is the neither nor pattern? How does that work? Well, neither nor is actually a little tricky. Some of you who are programmers should have no problems with this one because you're, you might be familiar with this operation. Um, but if you're not a programmer, <laughs> uh, or if you're you're just kind of like approaching this intuitively, there is a way to think about it. Again, all claims are expressing information. They're making claims. And that's what logic is doing too. We're just trying to figure out like what's the shape of the information that's being provided? What are you telling me? What am I, if I believe you, what have I learned? If, and again, even though there's a bigger sentence here, you can really do this divide and conquer. Just focused on one part. Pretend the entire rest of the sentence doesn't exist. And you're just working on neither Gnarls Barkley nor Rascal Flats will perform. How would you capture that? What would you do? Um, what if, if I believe this person, if they just said that, what would I have learned? And the information is to say neither Gnarls Barkley nor Rascal Flats will perform... Well, they're telling me two pieces of information, right? They're telling me Gnarls Barkley's not going to perform and Rascal Flats is not going to perform. So that's really an and statement. It's an and statement like that. And it's an and statement. Here, sorry, I'm trying to make this work here. It's an and statement where I learned what? Gnarls Barkley will not perform. And I also learned Rascal Flats will not perform. Well, if Gnarls Barkley performs as G, then I'm going to have to put this on this side as not G. Right? Gnarls Barkley did not perform. And what else did I learn? Well, I learned Rascal Flats isn't going to perform either. There we go. Okay? So that's how we captured this neither nor. Now, you could have also done it this way. You could have had it as not G or R. This little chunk replaced with this chunk, those mean the same thing. It's not the case that at least one of them. And that's really neither nor. It's like taking the either or pattern and putting a not in front of it. Um, so it's like saying not at least one of them being true. But it really means both of them are false. Um, maybe your intuition kind of like, comes at it picking up the stick from one end to the other either one of these is right for my ear if if you're just listening to this and asking what have i learned i think the most natural way in which your brain interprets it or at least my brain interprets it is i've learned two things gnarl barkley not performing rascal flats not performing so it's it's packaging up that information like an and statement where of two things that are not happening but this way is is just as good too uh okay so now we've, uh, once we've figured that out, we've covered the whole sentence, right? We got this Gnarls Barkley, nor Rascal Flats will perform. The whole thing's been covered. This is our answer right here. That's our translation. 
And again, it looks like a big string of symbols only because the original passage that we were analyzing is just one single claim. But like we saw before, if we're doing a translation for an argument, there will be multiple claims and multiple strings of symbols. Okay. Let's just clean this up a little bit since this is pretty messy. Let's make it let's make it nice and pretty and even use square brackets. How about that? I kind of like doing it in the messy way first because it reminds you about just taking it like piece by piece. There we go. That's the translation of the sentence. I, I like this extra translations problem, even though they got some really weird choices for like the content. I don't know what's going on with the people who wrote this textbook. Uh, but at toward the end here, they get into much more complicated ones. And if you can deconstruct these um, and take them piece by piece, I think you'll feel a lot more confident about your ability to do these translations. That's why I went after the most complicated ones to show you how, yeah, it takes us a while to do this, especially when I'm talking through it. Um, and it looks really scary, but if you follow the technique, what's gluing the whole thing together, and then just divide and conquer one chunk at a time, you can you can handle you can tackle anything. And this sentence is way more complicated than anything that we normally talk about in everyday conversation. If you're doing something in terms of like programming or you know some technical uh, art, then then maybe you might be exploring claims that have such a complicated logical structure to them but this is not normal so this is this is kind of stretching you a lot further than what I will be asking you to do on the exam I'll give you some tricky ones but nothing this tricky but that's that's why it's good practice if you can handle this then you can handle anything um, so I encourage you to, to take a look at these extra problems um, there's uh, the homework officially assigned from chapter 6 here plenty of problems to do here uh, for practice. I have you skip some so you can always do the ones that uh, I had you skip for extra practice. And then if you want even more practice for translations, there's this document, the extra translations from Hurley chapter 6. And then finally, um, finally we've got the this uh, extra truth table problems for you to work on too. So I hope this video has been useful for you. Um, if you were feeling stuck before just from hearing the lectures talk about this intellectually, maybe seeing some demonstrations will have helped. And if you want to do some more, I am really happy to do video chatting with students. There's definitely room for that. Um, and uh, um, what else was I going to say? Uh, um, and phone calls. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> just My brain just gave out. Uh, this video is another one of the supplement videos, so I'm not putting a code on it. It's not like it's for attendance, um, but it is recommended. So um, uh, hopefully uh, it's been worth your time. Um, and if it wasn't, if this was a waste of time or it wasn't done in a helpful way, I don't mind you telling me about that. I love that kind of feedback. That's helpful um, to help me adapt this class to, to you. Okay. Good luck with all this, and let me know how I can help you more. I'm always happy to talk to you. Bye.